So good evening. Uh, welcome to Student Symposium 1, or should I say Online Student Symposium 1. Uh, there was a reason why we have been organizing this series of webinars, online symposium, symposia, and online workshops. Uh, the reason being the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which somehow forced us to stay home. But somehow we wanted to translate uh, this negativity into something more positive. And uh, well, we can thank COVID-19 that because of it, uh, we are able to meet online and we are able to listen to people, uh, not only from Bangladesh, but from people outside Bangladesh. In our today's session, which is a student symposium in which we will listen to three students, three young researchers, scholars, and students. And we will listen to their experiments with and experiences during and in this COVID-19 pandemic. The chair of a department is likely to join us soon, uh, but we would like to start our today's session, which has three speakers, uh, Noyun Saeed Jibun, Jarin Shoili, and Shayan Pariel. Students uh, from two universities of Bangladesh and India. Now, the title of today's student symposium uh, tells it all. That is the danger and necessity of contact uh, that youths respond to COVID-19. It is not even necessary to say, to utter, that the COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to underscore and understand the ambivalence of touch, of contact. Being an infectious disease, it scares us and has made us maintain distance from every other human beings. We are mobilized to keep distance from the ones who are infected. And sometimes we are not even allowed to take care of dear ones or attend their funerals. The same distancing mechanism, sometimes named quarantine, sometimes social distancing, the same distancing mechanism is applied in our dealing with the ones who are apparently, only apparently, not affected. Our schools and universities are closed. Our shops and airports became non-places. Our usual rendezvous and dream tourist spots are becoming increasingly dangerous. Yes, human contact, particularly touch, has become dangerous. The ambivalence is this, that what we need in this pandemic period probably we need more crucially than other times, is human contact. Encountering an imposing spell of isolation, boredom, anxiety, and fear, we have felt the need of the presence of an other, of the others. Since touch has become troublesome, we have innovated other ways of keeping in touch with the other. This webinar is one such attempt of reaching the other, reaching each other. Our today's symposium concentrates on this ambivalence reflected in its title, the danger and necessity of contact. What we intend to explore is the ways the young people, precisely the university students, have responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, there are two major ways in which the students, the young people have been responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. One is external, the other internal, both being other-oriented. On the one hand, the youths have been involved in social activism directed to help the distressed and several business and commercial activities in their bid to make a productive use of time and skills. On the other hand, the youths have been struggling with their personal, familial, and social lives that have impacted upon their psychology and their personality. Our today's presentations will focus chiefly on the second way, that is the ways the youths have managed their and others' psychopathological trauma. As we say that we have three students in our today's session, 
Uh, we would like to start this session with Noyun Syed Jibon. Now, Noyun Syed Jibon is a student of MAPW in English Studies in the Department of English, Changinago University, Bangladesh. He is presently interested in learning the therapeutic value of literature. During the COVID-19 pandemic, he has researched on the ways in which literary narratives enable readers to cope up with emotional insecurities, internal conflicts, and traumatic experience. He has also published several articles on these issues at several online platforms during the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, though we are still in. So today, he, uh, the, talk of it, the title of his talk is Literary Care, a Deeper Immunity, Literature Vis-a-Vis -vis the COVID-19 Pandemic. So now in Sajibon, the floor is yours, and we will listen to you. Thank you very much, sir. It's really an honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, all the amazing faculties, uh, alumni, and current students of English Department of Jang Yunogar University for achieving the 50 years of success. And uh, I would also like to thank our honorable uh, chair, Professor Dr. Liza Nasreen Ma'am, and uh, uh, the convener, Professor Mashru Shai Hussain Sir, and all the members of the committee for arranging such a useful series of symposiums for us, and also allowing students uh, like me uh, to participate. So to begin with, uh, there is a uh, Native American proverb that says, the one who tells the story rules the world. Yes, apart from entertain or inform, stories have the power to be incredibly uh, powerful. Recently, I have read an interesting research paper about uh, reading Harry Potter and Twilight, which basically suggested that if you get people to read a couple of chapters of Harry Potter, uh, they will rate themselves higher than other people in their ability to move something just using the power of their mind. The people who read about the vampires will likely to believe that their teeth are slightly longer than other people just reading a chapter or two of Twilight. Psychologists call this effect assimilation, where the reader takes the qualities of the characters in the stories. I hope I'm not the only one to have noticed that people uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic are uh, reading again a couple of literary texts that they read long ago. And there are reasons. Our turn to literature is not just a means of passing lockdown time or escaping the harsh reality of pandemic, but it is more. Literary narratives providing resilience, a sort of care or medicine. They mobilize us to identify with fictional characters and their problems and supply us solutions, or at least making us prepared to encounter the trauma. Rita Sharon, a Harvard trained physician with a PhD in English literature, argued that literary narratives are medicine. The medicine works better when it is practiced with the narrative competence to recognize, absorb, interpret, and be moved by stories of illness. This ability to move and heal through stories has become very important during the COVID-19 pandemic, when we are asked to avoid physical contact or visits, uh, psychologists or therapists for dealing with mild mental health issues. So influenced by this notion of narrative medicine, I will now address four literary texts of different places, periods, and genres to explore how narratives may help individuals develop psychological immunity and philosophical insights to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, if we are being honest, uh, yes, in this COVID-19 pandemic, we are scared. Uh, death by corona is scary, not only because it is death, but because it is about dying alone. The thought of dying alone with a respiratory sickness is too big to hide under the mask and too quick to lead us to the wicked nihilism. In situations like this, Leo Tolstoy's novella, The Death of Ivan Ilyich may help, written in Russian and published in 1886, this book 
really helps us explore not only the meanings of life and death, but also the psychology behind terminal illness, later discovered by American psychologist Kubler-Ross as the stages of grief. The novella, the work, traces the working of the mind of a dying Russian judge in his deathbed. Initially, he denies it, saying, it can be me having to die. Then he questions, why hast thou done all this? Then he bargains, and the failure of which causes him depression, which finally leads him to accept death. In this novella, Tolstoy makes us think that do we really fear death? or do we fear life? Because even Ilyich, at the final stage of dying, realizes that he lived a very superficial life and was materialistically blinded most of his life. But he eventually finds solace in the forms of selfless love and kindness and care from his little son and from his caretaker, Gerasim. So when he embraces death, he is not scared anymore. Thus, the death of Ivan Ilyich is Tolstoy's parable of living. Living well is the best way to die well. He tells us that we don't fear death, we fear life, because we feel that we haven't spent our life as we were supposed to. But how we are supposed to live to be happy? The answer that the novella gives is the one that was supported by a 75-year study of Harvard University is that Good, genuine relationships keeps us happier and healthier. The novel thus provides us a great deal of insight to approach death and terminal illness, an insight which we may call intellectualization, a defense mechanism that allows an individual to look at the series of death as it is and remain a detached observer of the situation. Uh, another major trauma caused by coronavirus is due to the fact that the killer enemy is invisible, too tiny to be seen, yet too powerful to be stopped. The, at, the attack of the virus has overwhelmed our healthcare system, threatening so many people's lives, creating uncertainties and anxieties. Yet there are people, particularly the frontline workers, who have been set to defeat an external force so that humanity wins. Yes, a man can be destroyed, but never be defeated. That is what is stated in Ernest Hemingway's novella, The Old Man and the Sea. The old man, Santiago, who didn't catch a fish for many days, is able to hook a fish one day, but he cannot pull it in in his little boat. He is afraid that the, fig, the big mighty fish may pull the boat instead. So he does not tie the line to the boat. Instead, he keeps bearing the strain of the rope with his shoulders, back, and hands. But ultimately, he is able to kill the fish. And while he is bringing it to his home, he finds the fish is no more. It was devoured by the hungry sharks. But he was not defeated by the sea. As we are not defeated by this coronavirus, one must be quick to connect the struggling old man with our frontline workers, including the doctors, nurses, police, and rubbish collectors. Or we may connect each of us with Santiago, because like Santiago, we have scars on our faces due to wearing face masks. Many of us are also losing jobs and savings, like the way the old man lost the body of the fish eaten by the shark. However, the sea and struggle for survival bring out the best of the old poor fishermen. The COVID-19 pandemic has also brought out the best of humanity. In the midst of news of death and corruption, of human loss and greed, there are good pieces of news also. Like the statistics of charitable giving are soaring. People tend to practice compassion and care for the other. The coronavirus, isn't the only contagion. Kindness, hope, charity, and endurance are spreading too. Now, uh, if inspiring stories like Santiago's may uplift our spirit in a pandemic, 
What about works of literature that look at the darkness of our mind, our society, or our life? May they work as antidote? Maybe yes. In Samuel Beckett's play, Waiting for Godot, we find two tramps, Vladimir and Estragon. They are waiting for Godot. They have never met Godot. They do not know whether he exists, and they may never meet him. Yet, they decide to carry on waiting. This meaninglessness but desperate act in the face of utter meaninglessness is the condition of the absurd. The characters attempt suicide, but they do not. They plan to quit, but they do not. This is absurd. But the question is, is absurd demeaning, particularly in a crisis situation like the COVID-19 pandemic? From a psychoanalytic perspective, it is not. Rather, it is a kind of defense mechanism. The story of two people eternally waiting for some godo might be absurd, but it is far from simply pessimistic. Because the ultimate impact of the absurd is laughter. Maybe it's a dry, ironic laughter. Referring to the trauma of Sisyphus, Camus once said that one must imagine Sisyphus happy. For Thomas Nagel also, absurdity is okay. Quote, War, it warrants neither that much distress nor that much defiance. There, if there is no reason to believe that anything matters, then that doesn't matter either. And we can approach our lives with irony instead of heroism or despair. This brings me to my fourth literary text, Coleridge's The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. What if this pandemic is a curse? the result of our collective misdeeds towards nature. After all, it is we who cut the trees and make the ways for the tigers to come from the jungles. Let's remind ourselves that our ancestors saw nature as mother figure and asked us to respect it. At some point in history, we may have forgotten this ancient wisdom, but today, when pandemics and abnormal weather phenomena are becoming the norm, it's time to listen to nature and try to understand why a virus that silently existed for ages in the animals suddenly turns into a pandemic causing pathogen. In the poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, the mariner kills a welcoming albatross for no valid reason, a crime which leads to a spell of the death of all inmates and, and the consequent isolation from any hope and humanity. But at the end, Mariner finds redemption in his unconditional love for living beings. The narrative thus exposes that what, what have done to nature and what we need to change. Let us not forget that COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease, the first case of which was identified in a seafood market of Wuhan in China, where wild animals were kept, killed, and sold. What Coleridge's poem does is renewing what we knew but might have overlooked. That is, the beauty and the interconnectedness of everything in nature. And if we realize that, that not only humans, but everything in nature are connected, it will leave our world a more habitable place. So to conclude my talk, I'd like to say that the COVID-19 pandemic is not only a health crisis, it is also a psychological crisis, an emotional crisis, a philosophical, a social crisis. As, and as Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General says, it is a human crisis. So when dealing with these crises, literature, particularly literary narratives, are always the source of empathy, tolerance, compassion, and trust. Literary narratives can thus work as medicines and provide an alternative immunity an immunity not to the physical collapse of a body, but an immunity to the psychological deterioration of humanity. While literature offers hope and inspiration, it also supplies tragedy and irony so that we can negotiate with the absurdity of the moments and find our own ways out. This is literary care and here lies an alternative immunity to loss and collapse. Thank you very much. I hope you find my talk uh, 
interesting. And if you have any further queries or comments, you are most welcome. Uh, thank you, Noen Syed Jibun. Uh, in his uh, short talk, uh, what he did is to concentrate on the therapeutic impact of literature, particularly in dealing with and healing uh, the trauma during a pandemic period. Uh, referring to four seminal literary texts, he renewed the argument that literary narratives may work as medicines and may offer alternative immunity, immunity from the sense of collapse and of trauma. Now, uh, let me uh, remind the audience that we will take questions uh, both through chat box and question answer box, and also if you can ask questions, but uh, you can ask, yeah, we will uh, take questions only after all three uh, talk sessions end. Uh, then please raise your hand so that we can identify you and take your questions. Meanwhile, you can keep asking questions or writing observations in the chat box and question answer box. Well, this takes us to our second speaker, and she's Jarin Tasdim Shoili. She's a student of Masters in Literatures and English and Cultural Studies in the Department of English, Jahanginog University. And Abhita Shoili is a creative writer. She had attended a couple of creative writing courses and regularly contributes poems, short stories, flash, flash fiction, and movie reviews in reputed journals and newspapers. In this year, right before the COVID-19 hit the country, she presented a paper at an international conference in Dhaka on post-colonial perspectives, language, literature, and culture, and the global south in the Daffodil International University. Today, she is going to talk on the topic entitled, Looking on the Inside, Developing Interpersonal Relationship During the COVID-19 Quarantine Period. Jarin Shoili, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the psychological challenges experienced in this COVID-19 quarantine period. Um, in my talk, I will emphasize that uh, developing our relationship with ourselves can be an important productive work and how self-talk can be a helpful coping mechanism. And I will also share some self-talk methods to battle against these psychological challenges. I hope you can view my PowerPoint. Well, if you search by hashtag quarantine productivity on Facebook, you will find more than 1000 people posting about their activities. Well, in this slide, we can see that somebody has posted about the completion of his or her online course. Somebody has posted about a new song and somebody is talking about the publication of his or her article and different activities like that because people are trying to make the most of their pandemic time. Well, this coronavirus pandemic is marking a turning point, a moment to be described as before and after. Our self-concept or the way we used to know ourselves has also changed significantly. Because of the adaptive mechanisms during this lockdown period, there have been personality changes among us as well. Most of the time we are locked inside. That's why we have to face ourselves for a long time, which is not an easy job for many of us. So here are some problems regarding self-concept many of us has been facing and I hope my audience will be able to relate with me. The first one is dissociation. Dissociation is a condition where a person confuses between thoughts and reality. It is a kind of experience where an individual most of the time lives inside his or her head and 
he is unable to distinguish between his body and mind and he feels disconnected from the present reality around. The second challenge is lack of focus. Lack of concentration, lack of being in the, pres uh, being in the present. These are the some kind of problems we have been facing. For example, attending online classes or any other day-to-day -day activities. Number three crisis is personality change. This is a problem most of us have been facing. For example, for my part, I was questioning my life goals and the things I used to love to do. There were different voices inside my head that made me confused. This condition is commonly known as cognitive dissonance where someone becomes self-contradictory towards himself and it's a condition where a part of ourselves believe that I'm believing in something, but a part of me may believe in something else. So it's a self-contradictory position. The next one is linguistic crisis. For a long time, I was unable to translate my thoughts into words. And the next one is self-criticism because there are days I blamed myself for my sudden psychological changes and my inability to engage in productive activities like others. For example, some of my friends were attending online courses, some were studying, so I felt like I was doing nothing. So what else can we do in the face of such, such challenges? Well, I asked myself that I can do something different, something uncommon, maybe common yet uncommon, or not properly addressed. That is, I decided to develop my own relationship with myself or interpersonal relationship. Now, what is interpersonal relationship? It refers to one's relationship with oneself. It is performed by interpersonal communication or communicating with the self. It can take two forms. One can be self-talk and the other can be internal dialogues. Self-talk. Self-talk combines conscious thoughts and unconscious beliefs and biases and provides a way for the brain to interpret and process daily experiences. Self-talk is the interpersonal component of human communication. It is basically an inward looking exercise where we can, that influences how and what we say and how we respond to others. Self-talk can be performed by internal vocalization, reflective thinking, and it is also performed by verbalizing one's own thoughts. In self-talk, both sender and the recipient represent the same person, and it helps building self-concept and self-image. Why self-talk is productive during quarantine? It can be viewed as an important coping mechanism. It can create scopes for mental spaces because we all know that human mind is the space for self-negotiation and self-acceptance. It can create accommodation for the multiplicity within ourselves. It can help us reconnect with our authentic self and it can serve as a preparation for the post-quarantine life. how to develop interpersonal relationship. Number one is butterfly hug. Butterfly hug is a grounding, te a grounding technique to calm anxiety in stressful situations. It can also be done as a form of mirror self-talk exercise where you can stand in front of a mirror, hug yourself with both of your hands, look at yourself in the mirror and tell yourself that I embrace all sides of me, the good and bad ones. This is a very helpful exercise, especially if you are struggling with self-image issue or crisis of self-love. This exercise will endow us with self-love, personal healing and sense of self-acceptance. Number two 
is third person self talk third person self talk helps to negotiate between our battle between pre pandemic self and pandemic self this creates a scope for a hybrid space where temporal and spatial dimensions of self referential emotional processing and cognitive control takes place third person self talk distances an individual from his or her emotional experiences for example using my own name quickly changed my emotional responses and it reminded me that my emotions are not me this self talk method allowed me to see myself from an objective point of view number 3 is petal power exercise this psychological exercise is a self help tool for repetition of negative thoughts it includes thought restructuring and reality check as well during the pandemic i was aware that my mind can create unnecessary stories which may not be true so by petal power exercise i learned to counter my negative thoughts this way here you can see two flowers in the left flower at the center of the left flower i wrote my negative thought for example i wrote that i'll never be able to pass my final exam and in the flower petals i replaced this negative thought by realistic and counter statements for example i wrote that i have never failed a test before or getting a few questions wrong isn't the same as failing or this time i'm doing my best to study this is one of the helpful self help tools that can help to counter our negative thoughts number 4 is reparenting reparenting is theorized by dr nicole lepera widely known as the holistic psychologist reparenting is a form of self talk that involves the practice of relearning how to meet our needs as adults this allows us to fulfill our psychological and emotional needs that our parents were unable to fulfill reparenting is talking to ourselves as a loving parent would this is a way of sending kind generous gentle and encouraging messages to ourselves this pandemic gave me an opportunity to be my own inner parent whenever i felt vulnerable or depressed i focused on the nurturing side of myself and i told myself don't worry you are safe the last one is setting boundaries mental boundaries are very important to preserve our energy from the negative factors and affective things going around us i told myself that not everything around me needed my response or reaction so whenever i felt triggered i focused myself and i asked myself will this matter to you if you do this or don't do this the asking this this question to myself actually helped me and helped me to control my and helped me to control myself now can self talk be productive activity in quarantine we can ask this question well it can indeed be a transformative act especially when it comes to mental distress during the pandemic social media timelines more or less felt like productivity contests to some people because not everybody has the same ability or mental capacity to face triggers so it is natural to feel overwhelmed or pressurized and people may worry that they may not doing anything this can lead to sense of low self worth and self doubt but we have to remember that sometimes it is okay not to be productive because we are fighting a global pandemic certainly some productive activities such as um writing painting journaling 
uh, etc. are other helpful methods for self-talk. Yet it is important to question the generalized concept of productivity and prioritize the psychological basis of self-care. Self-talk in this regard is the psychological aspect of productivity. I heard a saying, unless you learn to face your own shadows, you will continue to see them in others. After starting self-talk exercises, my own bonding with myself has strengthened. Unlike before, I am more aware of my thoughts, actions, emotions, and psychological patterns. In our usual busy lives, we do not have necessary time to take care of our minds. So this COVID-19 quarantine gave me necessary time to focus on myself. This way, self-talk enhanced my self-concept clarity and helped me enhance and help me embrace my personality changes as well. Self-talk also reminded me that how our sense of self is determined by the other. This long-term social isolation not only taught me the fellow of human relationship, but also my own relationship with myself, which is definitely a productive work. Now, my question goes to the audience. If you do not produce, will you disappear? Well, I'll leave the answer to this question to yourselves. But if you ask me, I would say that listen to your inner voice. Thank you for listening to me. If you have any comments or questions, you are most welcome after this session. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Jarin Shoili, uh, for this exciting uh, speech on the ways we can manage our trauma. So while uh, Noin Saif concentrated on one's dialogue with literature, Jarin Shoili took us to one's dialogue with oneself, uh, to interpersonal intrapersonal communication as a coping mechanism to manage our pandemic trauma. Referring to several therapeutic self-suggestions she proposed that looking on one's insight is as important and productive as expressing oneself before the other. As we said that we will take questions and observations after all the talks end. Meanwhile, you can also write your observation or questions in the chat box or in the question answer box. Now this takes us to the last and third speaker. It's Cheyenne Pariel. Cheyenne Pariel is an MA in English from the University of Guru Bongo, Malda, West Bengal, India. His areas of interest are gender studies, diaspora, memory and trauma studies, and science fiction. He has presented several papers at several national and international seminars and webinars. His paper entitled Decanonizing Cultural Myths, a reading of Sanjukta Das Gupta's Lakshmi Unbound as Soliloquy was published in the Lit Infinite Journal. He is also a musician, an actor, and a YouTuber. Today, we will listen to his talk entitled Transforming Trauma Virtually, Identity, Self-Care, and Social Connection During the COVID-19 Pandemic. So, Cheyenne Periel, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Mashru, sir, for such kind words of introduction. So uh, before my talk, I would first like to thank the Department of English, uh, Jahangir Nagar University, for giving me this opportunity to be a part of uh, this first online student symposium on the danger and necessity of contact, the youth's response to COVID-19. So, uh, oh, hard times come again no more. It's a famous song uh, by Stephen Foster. Though the song was uh, written many years ago, but uh, still, if we listen to the song, we can feel the pain inside it, uh, as we are also experiencing hard time. We are socially isolated, emotionally disturbed, and depressed. It is true that body-to-body -body interaction is very risky. 
as there is a fear of getting infected by the virus. Uh, but at the same time, interaction with the outer world is very necessary to survive. So what should we do to get out of this dilemma? How the young generation is responding to this pandemic? In my talk, I'm going to show with the PPT how we, the young generation, is transforming the trauma of this pandemic virtually. I'll bring uh, in insights from Susan Kresnika's model on human needs to show how the young generation is satisfying their basic needs during COVID-19 pandemic through virtual spaces. So uh, let us first see what uh, trauma is. According to the Oxford Advanced Learner Dictionary, it is a mental condition caused by severe shock, especially when the harmful effect lasts for a long time, an unpleasant experience that makes you feel upset and or anxious as well, an injury. So the, the trauma invokes a crisis of inescapability from the traumatic incident and is bound to referential return. In this COVID-19 pandemic, we are witnessing the loss of many lives, including many near and dear ones. Even I have lost two of my friends. One of them was my childhood friend. We feel anxiety, maybe waves of panic, particularly when seeing new headlines. And, and when we see that the uh, death counts are increasing rapidly, we feel the traumatic. We have fear too about our own death, but there are ways of dealing with this trauma. One of the ways of coping up with the pandemic is diverting our attention through and, uh, you know, uh, and towards digital platforms. So what we were used to do offline, now we are doing this on digital platforms. We are trying to forget the pandemic and selectively doing something to deal with it. In this context, I would like to bring in some insights from German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche's theory of active forgetting, which is very relevant in this context as it talks about dealing with the traumatic incident. In the second essay on the uses and disadvantages of history for life of untimely meditations, Nietzsche observes that active forgetting is a liberating power. It prefers selective remembering it diffuses and naturalizes the traumatic incident and helps us to negotiate between remembering and forgetting. This active power of forgetting can lead one to secure a happy, healthy life and build a new future. I have used active forgetting to formulate what I said selective doing, which is helpful during COVID-19 pandemic. Creative use of cyberspace is a kind of selective doing which helps us concentrate on creative things and help us uh, eliminate the memories of certain events that are irrelevant and harmful. Now, what cyberspace is? So cyberspace provides a multidimensional space. It creates virtual communities. It is an extension of reality. It creates virtual presence. So when the physical or on-site interaction is not possible, then what remains is the technologically mediated space for interaction, new creation and self-exploration. We are now very much dependent on the virtual platforms. We are working from home, being a part of this new normal. We are constantly exceeding our limitations. We are meeting our needs virtually. So Susan Krishnaka, a cultural anthropologist has done extensive work on human needs. She has developed a model, the human needs model that identifies three pillars of need. All are interconnected as the diagram suggests in one way or another. Self-care, social connection, and identity. The overlaps address the fact that in satisfying one's need for social connection, one might also be reaffirming an aspect of one's identity. These needs work in our subconscious. As we are more or less quarantined, we have feelings of discomfort, vulnerability, dissatisfaction, longing, and desire. So, we are doing things virtually to satisfy us. Like we are engaging ourselves in different webinars and online conferences. We are creating channels on YouTube, exploring our limits. We are reading and uploading posts on social media platforms with renewed vigor. So we are trying to create a virtual presence as an extension of or as an alternative to our physical presence. Cyberspatial reality is creating for us a virtual world to express ourselves and thus provides us a way of dealing with the trauma of this pandemic. So now I will discuss the three pillars of need identified by Presnika. So let us see first 
the self care it is about regulating energy and emotion understanding a wide range of emotion developing and maintaining cognitive skills function so according to krishnika when the pandemic upended life as we knew it many of the ways we were used to meeting our need, needs became untenable so people are learning new techniques to soothe their anxious mind it concerns for the maintenance of one most basic biological and emotional need so so now if we look at the content consumption patterns we can observe a huge surge in internet usage in mid april hundred of hundreds of thousands of live viewers around the globe tuned into one, hashtag one, uh, one world together at home a star studded concert series produced by the social movement global citizen and the world health organization different reports findings showcased a steep increase in content consumption as it reported that the time spent by average user used to be over 4 hours per day as compared to previous 1.5 hours on the social media platform you know i am i am also a youtuber uh, priyanka chakravarty and i created a channel named shobdunidhi just after the declaration of lockdown in india uh, you can check this out in youtube i hope you will like it uh, i performed in an online play natoker moto organized by our drama club of university of gorbongo um actually i i play guitar i often upload songs on facebook uh, trying to communicate with myself and my friends there i find this activities as an anodyne to deal with this horrible phenomenon now the second pillar of the need is social connection it's about forging new relationships maintaining existing relationships feeling a sense of belonging within broader social group according to krishnika social connection needs arise from humans deeply social nature we are ultra social species whose survival rests on our ability to maintain social connection through close interpersonal relationship and a broader sense of belonging in society as social distancing and isolation severely restricted people's ability to connect technology is there to help bridge the gap somehow the sense of belonging to larger social groups makes us feel connected to a more expansive an enduring social fabric part of something bigger than ourselves so youth engagement for so global action is reflected in the hundreds of positive stories of youth engagement and resilience in unesco's my covid 19 story campaign the written and video testimonials that unesco received represent all regions of the world proving once again that youths are the key actors when it comes to developing innovative solutions to the global challenges that the world faces the with me genre where the viewers vicariously share in an activity performed by a creator has been particularly pertinent for life under lockdown audiences across the globe have devoured it views of hashtag with me videos have grown by 600% since march 15 so the last pillar of uh, the human needs is identity it's about un understanding the current self understanding and reconnecting with the past self and envisioning the future self so krishnika explains identity encompasses the whole experience and understanding of the self in all its complexity and cap capacity for change and according to her it also impacts our other needs how we understand ourselves and our experiences fundamentally shapes the way we care for ourselves connect with others and operate in the world around us so people sought to reaffirm and redefine themselves as the pandemic disrupted plans jobs and myriad things that play a role in self perception in recent months the online activities of youth have proved to be an attractive way for them to express who they are and inform who they might become so this is uh, what i meant by the phrase transforming trauma virtually we are actively trying to forget the harmful memories and satisfying our basic needs within the virtual spaces so now at the end i can say that keep calm you know it's the new normal so uh, i would like to end my presentation by a clip uh, of our a video a video song bela bosh uh, it was it was rewritten by priyanka chakravarty and sung by me so uh, let's hear it
Augusta Messenta. So uh, that's it. Uh, we have tried to recreate it to raise some uh, serious issues that we are facing during this pandemic. So you can go to our channel to see the full video. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Cheyenne Pariel, for this exciting presentation at the same time, uh, athletic performance. So Cheyenne Pariel uh, rather brought out another means of dealing with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, the creative use of uh, cyber space, or we can also say uh, the creative use of virtual space. And that uh, conforms to his title, that is trans translating trauma virtually. So while social media and platforms like Facebook and YouTube have generated serious problems, the same media has played and been playing a major role in translating trauma in the pandemic period. Uh, so the time has come that we will uh, take questions and observations from the audience. Uh, there are several questions and observations in our chat box in the question and answer session. And uh, we also found people who raised hands. Uh, so. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, Noyon, Syed Jibon, and uh, there are two questions. Uh, one is uh, in the uh, question answer session. I, I think uh, uh, Noyon Syed Jibon answered it. That is, uh, would you like to suggest any book to help deal with adolescent depression? Yes, now in Sajivan, do you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. I have already written the book, uh, which actually helped me to uh, uh, to deal with the uh, depression that yes. came with mention, adolescence. Mention some of them, yes. Uh, like uh, 13 Reasons Why by J. Asher and uh, The God of Small Things by Arundhati Roy. These are the books really that really helped me. Okay. Fine. Uh, so there are questions written. Let us take up, uh, to, uh, take into account there some raised hands, and let us see if they have anything to ask. So I found Tohidul Islam. Are you there? And do you hear me? Then uh, you can uh, make a question or observation. Tohidul Islam, are you there? Okay. 
then uh, Tanvir Hussain, are you there? Yes, Tanvir Hussain, yes. Please identify yourself and make your observation or question. Tanvir Hussain, do you hear us? Okay, uh, so there might be uh, some problem with connections. Now, uh, there are questions for uh, Jareen Shoili. And Jareen Shoili would like to take the questions and respond. Yes, sir. I'm fine with it. Yes, please do uh, tell us the question and then tell us your response. Uh, I can find some questions in the question answer box. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is Sadia Tasnu for Momi. Yes. Uh, she's, she has written something long, but her main question is that um, how should we or one get the soul back that got lost during the uneventful days? Yes. Well, uh, finding the soul is actually a never ending process. We can never really find ourselves, but at least we can try. But if you want to know about this pandemic situation, um, I would say that talk to yourself more often than you do in usual times. I think that will help because sometimes we get so lost by other voices around us. Who is saying what or what's my father is saying or what my friend is doing or things like that. So sometimes you can sit with yourself. You can take some uh, take a pen or paper or simply you, you don't need that you can just verbalize your thoughts and you can just listen to your inner voice i think that can be one of the help, helpful ways to find your soul back so okay yes. uh Jaren, there is another question from boshiru zaman kokon we are actually taking questions in which we can identify the uh, speaker or the participant uh, we are sorry that we cannot take questions when we cannot identify the speaker so Boshiru Zaman Kokon asks, it's the time to concentrate on oneself through self-talk. Uh, so the ways of self-talk that are stated by the speaker can be helpful to free ourselves from psychological crisis anxieties. But how about the ways uh, that setting boundaries, how can setting boundaries be set up in mind? Uh, probably how can be used or activated? Well, setting boundaries, Actually, it's a real struggle, but uh, we can take up some measures. For example, uh, we can write down something because I have noticed that just only talking to me does not help all the time. For example, I am getting constantly anxious and stressed by the things going around me. In those times, I basically make a list. For example, I take a paper and I make a list, especially the issues that are bothering me and I give a reality check and I tell myself that these are the priority list these are the things I should concentrate right now I don't need other things so I keep looking at that list and I think you can do the same this can help okay thank you now there is a question from uh it's Galaxy A10. I mean, are you there? So would you please identify yourself? Uh, I guess, okay. Uh, this someone called Galaxy A10. Uh, the question is this, that uh, during this time, we have become online while staying home. And uh, the person saying, now I don't want to read anymore. So what can be done to get out of this? So any of the panelists, any of the speakers can respond to this. Or you may three of you may respond differently to this question. Uh, this person does not want to read anymore. Uh, so, what to be done? So, Noin Sajibon, how would you respond to this? Because you say that reading books uh, might heal. So, if someone does not want to read, so any way out? So, uh, I don't think uh, one have to uh, read books to deal with this pandemic. Uh, to have a psychological immunity, but I will focus on narratives. I mean, uh, it can be any type of narrative. It can be a film, it can be a scientific narrative, it, it can be a uh, painting, it can be music as uh, uh, Parel said. So uh, I think uh, if, if okay. anyone don't uh, yes. want to read books, uh, yes. it, it's fine. Uh, then, 
point. Okay, then Shine and Jarin, do you want to add something to it, this question? Sir, I would like to make a comment that not being able to read uh, should not be um, a stressful thing to think about because uh, sometimes uh, during the moments of crisis, we need to be flexible with ourselves. So sometimes there are uh, there are many things that we uh, maybe uh, we love to do, but now those things are not attracting me anymore. So there's uh, no need to be rigid on yourself. Just go with the flow and things will be fine. Yes, Sean, would you like to uh, say something about it? Uh, yes, sir. Actually, uh, uh, I'm completely agree with Jari, uh, Zareen that yeah, it's true that uh, there is uh, there is no there is nothing disappointing in this that you are uh, not you know able to read. Yes, uh, something sometimes it happens, but uh, it will pass away soon. I can say that. Okay, that's fine. Uh, this being optimistic is nice. Uh, now, Tohitul Islam, you raised your hand again. I mean, is it that you want to ask question or it was a mistake? Okay, now uh, we may want to listen to uh, to professors who we find here. Uh, so we have uh, uh, Shamipendra Banerjee. So, Shubhi Kandu, are you there? And would you like to uh, make any comment or any observation? Uh, hello. Uh, yes, uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, and uh, thank you, Mashrur, for uh, including me in the panel, though I, w I didn't have any uh, intention or plan as such. It was a wonderful session. Uh, congratulations to all the three young students uh, for raising some very pertinent issues uh, related to the pandemic. One thing I was uh, just wondering while or thinking of while listening to them is that uh, young minds are uh, responding. I mean, initially, you see that the pandemic, when it set in, uh, it had uh, unsettled us. But uh, in meanwhile, we have been responding to it. And uh, it's a very optimistic uh, response that has come out from almost all the panelists uh, uh, Nayan has uh, wonderfully pointed out uh, certain key literary texts and what it teaches us, what it tells us. Uh, um, Jareen has also, uh, yeah, the kind of responses that Jareen has received shows that many of us, many of the attendees are also facing a uh, psychological crisis, if not uh, COVID itself, but COVID-induced uh, psychological crisis and we are all seeking uh, alternatives to come out of that. And of course, Shayan has also spoke of uh, the cyberspace. Um, yes, we have been virtually connected to each other. I think it wouldn't, won't have been possible. I mean, there are these positive sides of it as well. This kind of student symposium where, uh, you know, people from India are joining in, uh, in this, uh, you know, session. So this would not have been possible uh, without this. So all these uh, new elements have uh, reshaped our own sense of looking at, uh, you know, life as such. So uh, that's that's a general, very general comments. Wonderful session. Uh, thanks to all the panelists. That's it, Mashur. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Shami Pendro. And of course, uh, Shami Pendro is uh, uh, direct involved. I mean, he uh, formulated the play, uh, the online play that Sean Periel was talking about, that is Nato Ker Moto. And uh, that was really interesting. And hopefully we will be able to uh, watch it sometime uh, through this webinar or some other session. And also uh, Shomi Pendro uh, pointed out a thing that is the responses that the speakers are getting through the chat box suggests that uh, somehow the way we connect and somehow we responded to it. Okay, uh, now uh, this takes us, I mean, uh, we are running short of time because we would like to close it in uh, one hour time and somehow we uh, are able to uh, manage it. Now, uh, it is important that we listen to the young people, the youths, and how they attempted to uh, manage the trauma that uh, was generated and has been gener generated by the COVID-19 pandemic. But of course, uh, the something else has been left, which we may want to address in uh, one of our next uh, seminars, webinars, or symposia. Uh, that is the way the young people or people in general have responded actively uh, to uh, the uh, very material problems that COVID-19 has generated. Uh, that is particularly the social and other activism 
that also uh, the youth uh, have been involved with. So this uh, takes us to the end of today's session. I would like to thank all the three uh, participants, uh, Noam Said Jibon, Jarin Shuili, and Shine Pariel for making this fascinating and invigorating speeches. I would like to thank the Department of English, Jahanginagar University, uh, particularly the members of the seminar committee, more precisely, Professor Dr. Saniyat Sattar, who has uh, been taking care of uh, the technology and a BDRN personnel uh, who hosted the session and also Professor Dr. Sanya Sattar. Uh, and we are thankful to the audience uh, who have been with us uh, uh, and uh, made comments and also through their participation, uh, not only made this event meaningful, but also uh, uh, inspired the student participants. And of course, it uh, somehow proved or testified to the way uh, that we can translate limitations into something possibility uh, when we are stuck. Now, uh, as we know that it's a kind of series of webinars, so our next webinar will be in the new year, in the next year, uh, when uh, we will listen to a scholar on uh, talking on neoliberalism and our education. So uh, let me wish, let us wish all of you a happy new year. Well, happy with uh, no irony, rather with a tone of defiant optimism. Uh, in this uh, new year, we might be thinking of uh, what we wished in the last year. Uh, so how did we plan to celebrate or uh, uh, carry on with uh, in uh, 2020 and what actually happened? So similar thing may continue. New things, uh, new worries may appear or these uh, worries may disappear. Uh, so the thing is that it is uh, every new year is a kind of ritualistic welcome, ritualistic entry into renewing ourselves. So when we say happy new year at this time, uh, we mean it really that it should be happy. And maybe it's, uh, going, it's going to be happier near if it somehow get us out of this uh, traumatic moments. So let us stay safe and sane until then. I'd mm -hmm. like to thank again the three speakers and uh, we hope and we will keep going on. Let's reach each other. Let's enrich each other. Thank you and see you somewhere in future in the next year. Happy New Year.